No. Okay, well, thank you all for coming tonight to Red Balloon, here to celebrate Heather Anastasio's last book in her glitch for all the As always, uh, my name is Amy, and um, I think I've met most of you already, so thank you for coming, thank you for supporting our store so we can continue to bring amazing authors and other great events to all of you. Um, so we are going to hear from Heather, um, prepare for any questions if you have them, and then we have cake afterwards. Um, you can express your cyborg self with some computer tattoos and participate in our game. If you haven't already guessed, your secret robot slash cyborg. We have some extras of that. So, um, and I want to encourage everyone, if you haven't already signed up for our newsletter, the sign up is at the front counter, and um, one of the best things about our newsletter is we have an author or illustrator spotlight. And Heather was our um, spotlighted author for July, and so she answered some great questions. Um, so I love that she said, now what is your favorite season? Now that she lives in Minnesota in spring. <laughs> and spring in Texas is a lot different than the spring in Minnesota, and definitely not winter in Minnesota. Um, her favorite books as a child, which, see if you guys recognize these, The True Confessions of Charlotte Doyle, favorites. <laughs> Um, a Ring of Endless Light by Madeleine Olingle and Stepping on the Cracks by Mary Downing Hahn. I read two out of those three, so that's a fun. So Heather um, grew up in Texas, but is now one of our great local authors. Lives in Minneapolis with her husband and son. And How long ago 
compared to now that it's published, were you actually writing and revising and working on shutdown? Or kind of how long? Oh, how long did shutdown itself take? Yeah. Okay, so I, I had a draft of it. The first draft was last May. So, so then it was um, basically, this is how last year went down, which is insane. Like, write finally an actually good draft of Override in April. Write first draft of this in May. Do another revision in June. Go back for another second draft of this in July. August was like, you know, copy edits on this. And so, and then we, like, and then we didn't get to copy edits on this book until uh, January. So it was really all very squished and tight. But, but we actually got to skip line edits and just went straight into copy edits because this book just came out so much better than. <laughs> <laughs> Makes side by side. So, so yeah, so this book went crazy fast. So it was all done, you know, by the end of January, since May. So it, was just, it was crazy. I don't know how it worked. I'm just thankful that it did. <laughs> Is that confusing at ever at all, going from one book to the next, and then whatever you know that you're working on in the future, which I would love to know about if you could tell me. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, I liked having the break on each book. I felt like I would cleanse my palate and you know, get some perspective on the other book. And it was usually, a, they were in month-long chunks, so I'd have just enough time to really get perspective to dive into the other one. And I'd been working with the same characters for this one, so that was nice, so I'd think about them in different places along, along their journey, and so I think that added some resonance that worked really well. But as far as other things I'm working on, I have a book on submission currently to my editor, so we'll see if they pick that up, but it's a, uh, it's a contemporary ghost story with like, Beauty and the Beast kind of thing going on, so I'm excited about that. And then I've got some other ideas percolating that I might want to jump into like this week. <laughs> <laughs> so do you write two books a year? Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> At least I have last year and this year. Um, uh, although I just wrote a book that I, I like, I hate, so I don't think I'm not, it might not even go anywhere. So I don't say that I write two good books a year. <laughs> so we'll see. I thought I was past that, but I would stop writing books that I would just shelve. <laughs> Probably not encouraging to all the others. Any other questions? Did you do any research or consult anyone? Um, occasionally, I would like, hey, Drago, here's this bit of like tech that I'm using. And he would read it and be like, that doesn't make sense at all. <laughs> I was like, and he was like, he would explain how it might work, and I'd be like, no, 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 I just need some cool like catchwords, <laughs> and then I'll insert those. And then any other time, I need to research like how the brain works or anything else like that. I just like look on YouTube videos of college professors talking. So I don't know what authors did to research before you do videos. Yes. Alright, how difficult was it writing Adrian in this book? He's a character we've all grown to love and admire, but then suddenly everything was ripped away from him. That first down in shutdown was that first chapter in shutdown was absolutely heartbreaking. I know, evil author. <laughs> but because I'm an evil author, I have the most fun when my characters are in pain. <laughs> so I had fun with Adrian this entire book. <laughs> I had fun in these chapters where Sylvie just wants him to be a certain way, and then he just totally beat it off that way. And I delighted in that like tension and friction of that. So it's like, so some readers have said it's heartbreaking, and I'm like, but it was fun to write. <laughs> so, so I had a lot of fun with them. Um, Zoe is such a strong heroine in Shutdown. And she's the leader of the resistance, not knowing if she's going to succeed and survive or fail. That's a lot for a girl to take on. Did you always plan on having Zoe become this leader? Yes, I did. I, from the first front, I, you know, I wrote this book just as a potential standalone, and then we thought we'd send it out to see if we could get a bite for a trilogy. So at the end of this, she's sort of starting to take some leadership, but I always envision my like, it's like epic, strong girl taking on the world, like being the most powerful person in the world, basically. 
Um, but again, the thing that I lacked foresight on was that it's really difficult to make somebody be strong like that. Or since since we're in first person and we're in her head, it was very strenuous. And like Zoe was the most difficult character for me to write, ironically. You wouldn't think so because it's first person, but she was. So, so as I went through the series, I kind of, because I wanted Zoe to be a hero. That's what I was trying to do. But as I got into it, I got to the nitty gritty of what makes a hero and what do the heroes themselves feel? Do they just feel like, I never have any doubts and I go into battle and I will just do this because I know it's the right thing and I have straight, straight morals. And as, you know, that's not very interesting to read, number one. And number two, I wanted her to feel like a real girl a real character, so we get to see, and I got to play with her vulnerabilities as we went through the series, trying to figure out how it would feel to be a hero, and all of the second guessing, and everything else that goes along with that, and then in the end, just being like, there's no other way. If I don't do this, people I love are going to die, so let's just do it. <laughs> so that was how she got to be this strong heroine, so we'll see what you guys think when you read Shut Down. And if, and if I succeeded. <laughs> okay. Comments, movies. Oh, here's a good one. What was there, was there a particular? Oh no, that was that. One question you wished you asked, you were asked, but never were, and it's answer. So the thing that I'm always fascinated about when I go to author readings, but it's the question that you probably like is not kosher to ask, but I'm always curious. I'm like, what are your weaknesses as a writer? <laughs> I am fascinated about this. Like, what are the things you're consciously struggling with and working on? So I got to know, I got real close and familiar with my strengths and weaknesses in this series. I realized, oh, I can plot like nobody's business. I know the end from the beginning. If I get into a problem, I can work out like five different ways to try to sneakily get out of this. But what I'm not good at is voice and character which is, you know, kind of the most important thing because if your readers don't connect to your character, then you're just shot from the beginning. Nobody cares if they're doing cool plot things. <laughs> so, so yes, so voice is one of my biggest, but I'm constantly trying to figure out ways to work around and get around. And, and a lot of that comes down to motivation. What do they want? And what are they afraid of? Are they afraid of losing? And constantly trying to push up those emotional stakes the entire time. So that's what I struggle with and how I try to sneakily get around it. And uh, three favorite books you've recommended across all genres. I'll say Pride and Prejudice. It's my favorite classic. I can read and reread and reread this book. <laughs> and let's see, like contemporary series is Cassandra Clare, especially the Clockwork Angel series. I just finished the last book and I was like, genius! <laughs> And my favorite like literary YA would be Between Speak by White House Anderson, which is just gorgeous as far as language. And The Palmer Stars by John Green. Because the BBs. <laughs> so that's it for my internet questions. Any other questions about the process or anything from you guys? How did you feel writing the last word you were done? Just did you read walking away from the trilogy? You know, so many authors talk about this, I wondered, I wondered. But mainly, let's see if that is the last word. <laughs> oh, right. I, <laughs> the last word of the trilogy is light. I felt just really happy and satisfied. And mainly, like, I think a lot of people talk about being so proud of their trilogy since they finished it. But I mainly felt with an immense amount of relief. <laughs> I think I pulled this off. But, but I still, I do find myself missing the characters and missing being in Zoe's head. After fighting so hard to figure her out, I finally did. Mm -hmm. And now I miss, like, because I know exactly how she responds in situations. Now I'm, like, trying to figure out new characters. It's all hard again. <laughs> so Jess? You said uh, Zoe was one of the hardest. What was, what was, like, the most fun character? Okay, the most fun character is Max. Everybody loves to hate Max. I think I have a lot more sympathy than anybody does for him. Everybody just hates him. But I see how he could have been a good man. I see that. But then he just chooses the wrong path. Of course, I'm the one making him choose the wrong path, basically. <laughs> but I feel that tension in him. So, like, I, I would, you know, go to bed just thinking about him. <laughs> so, and he was the most fun because he was doing such tricky things and override. And then in 
you know, shut down, he's trying to make amends, sort of, but he's still himself, so he's inevitably ruining things. <laughs> by Carrie McGarry. So good. Um, let's see what else was. I just read something really good. Oh yeah, oh yeah, Trish Dollar's new book, Where the Stars Still Shine. She wrote uh, a name I can't think of. <laughs> anyway, good books coming out. And I love reading. I read constantly. It's like, I don't have a life, but I do read. <laughs> because whenever I'm writing or watching TV or anything, I'm just like constantly on like for inspiration radar. And if I'll see anything cool in a relationship, I'm like, ooh, I want to do something like that. So I, I constantly want to be reading and taking in art and other people's different ways of doing things so I can constantly be getting inspired and like questioning myself about how I'm going to use the characters, things I can do with them. So especially whenever I had a dry patch, I'm like, let me just read all the good books. <laughs> Try to soak up their awesome. <laughs> What is a typical day like? I mean, do you get up and write and then read, or how do you balance it all? Um, yes, I have a very quiet life in a little apartment up in the 13th story. But, so I wake up and I try not to get too absorbed into Twitter. And I try to write for like three or four hours. And then Jarvis and the kiddo come home and we have dinner and stuff. And then after they go, I try to write for another two hours. So theoretically, I'll get five to six hours of writing on a good day. And then I just read for the rest of the night. 